and former police chief Paul Pazin. What was your reaction when you first heard the news? You know, honestly, uh, kind of numb, to be honest. On that day, almost three years ago, Jacobs was standing beside and rattling a chain link fence when he says officers tackled him. Body cam footage shows a Denver police officer running toward Jacobs and then several officers holding him down. You can see an officer use his baton against Jacobs in the recording. I was hit like over the back of the head. I was trying to recover and, and get my bearings and was punched in the face. I was had a I had a baton shoved up my anus. He also injured his rotator cuff. Going into the physical injuries almost pales in comparison to the emotional trauma that I went through that day. In a probable cause statement at the time, DPD claims Jacobs was part of a group trying to push down a gate at Lincoln Park and adds they managed to bring it down and get inside. I think that's what drove the settlement. Uh, is that they knew they would have to explain this to, to a jury of, of Denver residents uh, and it just isn't justifiable. Denver police declined to comment on the settlement. According to the Internal Affairs Bureau, the officer involved did not violate use of force policy, but the officer and three supervisors violated other department policies in this incident. I hope that this story encourages anyone else who's been wronged to seek justice for themselves. I hope that Maybe someone seeing me be able to stand up and speak out encourages them to harness their voice in a way that I have. I asked Denver police if there will be any policy changes moving forward and have yet to receive a response for that question. I also reached out to the city attorney to ask them where the settlement money is coming from. They say civil settlement settlements typically come out of the city's liability claims fund and settlements over $5,000 require city approval. Next on Denver 7 News at 8, Fox News and Dominion voting systems have reached a settlement that'll cost millions of dollars. What we are learning about the last minute decision after a bumpy start to the trial.
Turning to Delaware now and the defamation case against Fox News Channel brought by Dominion Voting Systems. In a surprising and last minute twist, a settlement was reached between both sides. Justin Finch explains the millions to be paid and what led up to the settlement. A dramatic and unexpected finish to the defamation trial against Fox News Channel brought by Dominion Voting Systems. The truth matters. Lies have consequences. Today's settlement of $787,500,000 represents vindication and accountability. After a delay in opening statements was announced, Judge Eric Davis later revealing to the jury that Dominion and Fox News had resolved their case. Dominion CEO calling the resolution historic, even though it was for less than half of the $1.6 billion in damages it was seeking. Fox has admitted to telling lies about Dominion that caused enormous damage to my company, our employees, and the customers that we serve. Nothing can ever make up for that. Before the deal, jurors were tasked with determining if Fox acted with actual malice by knowingly broadcasting false information about Dominion's voting machines or acted with reckless disregard for the truth when Fox News host and guests falsely claimed Dominion's machines were rigged to favor Joe Biden over Donald Trump in the 2020 presidential election. And they're using a I, I, Venezuelan company as the, uh, as, the, as the vote counter, which is known for changing votes. Fox News owner Rupert Murdoch allegedly sent an email saying, really crazy stuff and damaging. Judge Eric Davis has already ruled that Fox could not argue to jurors it was merely repeating allegations pushed by former President Trump and his allies because they were newsworthy. And lawyers for Fox News did not hold a news conference, but did release a statement saying in part, we do acknowledge the court's rulings, finding certain claims about Dominion to be false. Justin Finch, ABC News, Wilmington, Delaware. Turning to weather now, we're in for a bit of a cool down after some really warm and nice yeah, days. It was yeah. nice again today. Uh, almost 80, but uh, we won't see that again for a while. Hmm. I know. Uh, <laughs> tell her sad. Disappointment all around. Uh, red flag warning still continues till 9 o'clock southeast Colorado, but then that'll be lifted. And there's not a lot of moisture showing up yet. A few showers over western Colorado. That'll be quite different by this time tomorrow evening. So this is looking off to the west from Denver. Just some high clouds coming in ahead of a change in the weather. Temperature today was not a record, but it was up close. 78 was the high, 82 is the record in 1987, 8 the record low in 1953, and the averages are 62 and 34. No precipitation today. Right now it's still warm out there, 66 at the airport, 67 downtown. The pressure 29.53, and the winds are out of the west-southwest at 15 miles per hour. Increasing clouds tomorrow morning and cooler, with temperatures staying in the 40s even by 11 a.m., uh, as this cold front moves through. We're warm and windy ahead of it, and this front is going to move through quickly tomorrow. It doesn't have a ton of moisture with it. That's mostly out to the east of us with some thunderstorms in Minnesota and Iowa, but there will be some snow showers coming in in advance of the cold front northwest Colorado by morning, partly cloudy on the plains, and not really all that cold tonight. It'll be in the 40s southeast Colorado, 30s northeast and 20s to low 30s in the mountains, uh, out at Keystone 31, Winter Park 28, Allen's Park at 30, the same with Estes Park, 40 at Broomfield and Boulder. Partly cloudy on the plains, snow showers developing in the mountains, and here comes that cold front moving through about lunchtime with a few showers developing and kind of snowy slick conditions up in the mountains. In the afternoon, showers and cooler on the plains. Snowy and slick conditions will continue up in the mountains. Temperatures there will be just in the mid to upper 30s and we'll see 50s to around 60 on the plains. Still some 70s to near 80 over southeastern Colorado just ahead of that front. Now the front comes through and ends up being a pretty good severe weather maker in the Mississippi Valley for Thursday. We'll have colder air. The mountains will get a little bit of snow, a little bit of rain, snow shower activity possible on the plains, but not a big deal. Kind of the same story for Friday. Those severe storms slide a little further to the south. We stay on the chilly side, and even Saturday will be on the cold side of this front. Weak area of low pressure moving along, some mountain snow and a few showers on the plains. The milder air then begins to return starting Sunday. 
A few showers tomorrow in 57. Rain, light snow and colder Thursday, some flurries Friday, a few showers on Saturday. This will not be a major storm for lower elevations. Some areas might pick up an inch or two of snow over the course of a few days. Mountains will see more, but the main store will just be some colder weather coming in. By Sunday, we're finally back to 62, 65 on Monday, and then next Tuesday, 60 with some showers possible Tuesday into Wednesday of next week. YouTube is cracking down on content related to eating disorders. The platform is banning videos that says that it says glorifies or promotes eating disorders. This includes behaviors like extreme calorie counting or purging after eating. Videos focused on recovery aren't included in the ban, but YouTube says that content will be restricted. Certain Americans will now be able to get another shot of the, of the bivalent COVID vaccine. Today, the FDA gave the green light for another COVID booster for older adults and people with weakened immune systems. Regulators say those who are 65 and older can get another dose of the vaccine as long as it's been at least four months since their, their first. Most people who are immunocompromised only need to wait two months. The CDC still has to sign off on the newest round of boosters. An Ohio family is sounding the alarm in hopes of saving lives after a teenager died trying to complete a challenge on TikTok. The challenge taking large amounts of Benadryl and now as Lionel Moyes explains, the teen's family wants to change the law. New warnings about the Benadryl challenge on TikTok after the death of a 13 year old in Ohio. I'm going to do everything I can to try and make sure another child doesn't go through it. In the dangerous stunt, users take 12 to 14 pills of the antihistamine Benadryl in hopes of hallucinating. Jacob Stevens tried it with friends filming, but instead of hallucinating, his body started seizing. And they kind of just all come at one time and it was too much for his body. The family sharing this graphic image of Jacob in the hospital so others can see firsthand what the challenge did to him. The worst day of my life. He was on a ventilator for six days before doctors determined he would never wake up. No brain scan. There was nothing there. He said we could keep him on the vent, 
you know, he could lay there like that, but he will never open his eyes. He will never breathe on his own. Breathe on his own. Do anything like that. Smile. He'll never walk, talk. The FDA has warned about the challenge, saying it can lead to serious heart problems, seizures, coma, or even death, and has encouraged parents to lock up the drug. A search for the challenge on TikTok today shows no videos, instead directing you to a resource page with info on substance abuse. As for Jacob's family, they're now pushing lawmakers to impose age restrictions on medications like Benadryl. If it's my life goal to, to make that happen, I'll, I'll, I'll go at it till, till I die. Jacob will be laid to rest tomorrow. Those who knew him say he put a smile on the faces of those around him. Lionel Moyes, ABC News, New York. Uh, check one, two, three. Welcome to Denver 7 Sports. Blah, blah, blah. And, um, hey. Yeah, good to be here. Yeah. Welcome back to Denver 7 News on Local 3. I'm Amy Wattis. And I'm Jessica Porter. It's a big week for sports fans here in the Mile High City. A live look outside Ball Arena now where the Avs started Game 1 of the playoffs this hour. So exciting. Our Lionel Bienvenue joins us now here in the studio. And Lionel, you also are just back from spending time near the ice. Yeah, I was over at Ball Arena uh, earlier tonight and it is just a madhouse because the run to the repeat has begun. The Avs and Kraken dropped the puck about 20 minutes ago. Let's take a look at some of the early action for you. First period, Seattle was out skating and out playing the Avs. Eli Tolvanen in front, and oh, he scored on Alexander Georgiev. The Kraken? Yes, they are leading right now, 1 0 early in the first. The Avs only have one shot on goal to this point. Well, tonight's game is just about six months from when the Avs started the season, October 12th at Ball Arena. Captain Gabe Landeskog lifted the cup and skated around the ice. Then they raised a championship banner to the rafters, and Jack Johnson joined the festivities, although he was a Blackhawk that night. <laughs> well, the Avs made a trade, and Jack is back with the Avs. There he is. All this glory, the celebration is over, as we saw. A new playoff season has already started against Seattle. But Josh Manson told us today the strategy and the mindset that is the same as last year because it worked. They won the cup, and you don't fix what ain't broke. 
Same goal. I mean, uh, just finding a way to play our style of game and, and take it to opponents from the drop of the puck like we did last season. I mean, we, want, we don't want to dwell on that too much, but there are a lot of good habits that we had in that last postseason and a lot of the same guys in this locker room that we can um, we can try and impart that uh, into our game this year. Every game means so much, so it's it's pretty easy to get up for it, you know, get ready to go. So I really enjoy that part. Um, playoffs are the best time of the year. You come to the rink and the sun's shining and it's nice outside. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, you know, especially with this group, I think we got a good shot to have another good run again. So um, it all starts here tonight and we'll get ready to go. Well, the Nuggets were ready to go at Ball Arena on Sunday night. Game one against the T-Wolves. The Nuggets won it by 29 points, an absolute blowout. So there you go. They're the one seeds. They are rolling. They're in total control of this first round series. Wait, what? Are you nuts? No, they're not. No way, as Coach Michael Malone told us today. That's the message. You know, we haven't done a damn thing. I mean, like, if, if we're going to try to win a championship, we got 15 more games you got to get. And uh, for those of our players, not that they were, but if anybody felt that we could come up for air, we could exhale, we could feel good about ourselves, you're wrong. Oh, there's a lot of things we could have done better in game one. My job is to keep our guys um, humble and coach them, hold them accountable. It was a great game, no doubt, but you celebrate for a few minutes and you get ready. And uh, that's what today was all about. Well, today, uh, Nikola Jokic did not do much in practice. He has a sore wrist and his calf muscle is still tight, too. He is officially listed as questionable for game two tomorrow. But you got to believe uh, anything less than an amputation and joker will be on the court for game two. All right, let's head over to Coors Field now. There's a lot going on tonight, huh? Rockies and Pirates tonight. Welcome back, former Rocky Connor Joe. He chopped one to third. Ryan McMahon showing off glove and arm. The throw got Joe at first. Then bottom of the first, Chris Bryant. Wow, bat on fire. Run for your lives. He knocked one into the purple people and left. 425-foot homer. That's his second in the last two games. The Rocks led one nothing. Then Elias Diaz went that way, the other way, a wall banger to right. That scored C.J. Crone and Armac. The Rocks up 3-0, but, of course, it crashed to earth. Right now it is 5-3 Pirates in the fifth. Highlights on Denver 7 Sports at 10. Not a high school baseball in Thunder Ridge and Rock Canyon played at the Rock yesterday. Jaguars beat the Grizzlies 17-0. And take a look at this picture. You can see four kids sitting out there in right field. That's J.T. Shank on first. These are former Canyon players, including Braden Dooman and Micah Brown. They were out there hoping for a home run ball, and Chase Jaworski delivered. This is his eighth homer of the season. He's tied for second in all of Colorado. He has nine, but the one he hit against Mullen didn't count in the official stats. But watch the video from right field. Jaworski hits the homer with cell phone video rolling, and Micah Brown with his glove. Here it comes. He made the catch on the bike path. That's a long way. Everybody went nuts, and Rock Canyon has won eight of their last nine games. All right, that is all for now. We'll have the latest from Ball Arena, game one between the Avs and the Kraken, back on Denver 7 Sports tonight at 10, so we'll see you then. It's a good time to be a sports fan in the Mile High. Thank yeah. you, Lionel. Well, today, President Joe Biden signed an executive order aimed at helping more people find care for children, the elderly, and people with disabilities. The order includes more than 50 directives for federal agencies to take action to improve access. It'll also require the Defense Department to improve affordability of child care for military families. It also plans to raise pay and benefits for teachers and staff in the Head Start program. Going deeper, finding good child care is a struggle in the metro. I hear this from so many parents, and I can tell you it is a challenge. It's expensive, and the industry, it's stretched thin by shortages. Yeah, and there's an analysis by the Center for American Progress offers a new way to visualize which communities are experiencing child care scarcity. In Colorado, all areas highlighted in orange represent child care deserts. Now here's what's interesting. Much of the areas with child care scarcity overlap with communities experiencing high levels of poverty. The same is also true for parts of the metro with high percentages of black and Hispanic Latino populations. Now those options are getting even more scarce. Parents and ki with kids attending a downtown Denver preschool just found out that it's closing this summer. Denver 7's Micah Smith spoke with parents concerned over the Wonder Academy's shutting its doors. This group of parents won a lottery of sorts. 
getting their kids a spot in a downtown Denver preschool called the Wonder Academy. The wait list to get a kid below three years old into a daycare, um, they're two years long. We were super excited to have something that was local, um, a place where our kids were happy to be. But a week ago, they learned a developer bought the building from the Wonder Academy's landlord. The preschool closes July 28th. I have a wife and um, we wanted to make sure that we felt included and we wanted a, a community that was inclusive of the, the LGBTQ community. And um, when we had gone to other schools, we didn't quite feel comfortable. But coming to Wonder Academy, it was no problem. We were widely accepted. My granddaughter, Winnie, attends the uh, Wonder Academy here. My daughter is a single parent. She relies on public assistance to send her her uh, my granddaughter here through CCAP and most daycare centers don't provide positions for children who are who need assistance. In a statement to Denver 7, the owner and founder of the Wonder Academy, Chelsea Moran, said in part, there's been a shortage of spaces, especially in the infant and toddler age range, for well over a decade. And yet it's simply left to families to figure out a way to find care that aligns with their values and budget. It is heartbreaking. I just think that there's a child care crisis in this city, and I really think that it needs to be addressed. It seems really short-sighted to focus too much on the uh, uh, building housing for people who are ostensibly going to, some proportion of them, have kids and need child care. I'm not a a uh, city planner or a, a politician by any means, but I do think there needs to be some sort of protections for um, locations that are set up as educational facilities. You know, obviously public schools, but um, they're, you know, where are you going to put your kids between the time when they're three months old if you're a working parent? I just want to highlight how good the school is. I mean, they put a lot of work into uh, developing their staff. And these parents say finding that again. We're now on 15 wait lists um, across the city. I think we're on we're on about 15 different wait lists right now. Will be a big challenge. Reporting in Denver, Micah Smith, Denver 7. And we reached out to the city of Denver's planning department asking if they're considering child care facilities at risk of redevelopment. In a statement, they responded, quote, while the city isn't involved in the lease agreement with the Wonder Academy that they have with the building owner or the sale of the building, we have already acted through code updates to try and increase access to child care. In 2021, the city updated, updated zoning in its Golden Triangle neighborhood plan. It requires larger developments to retain spaces for commercial services, such as future child care facilities. All right, ready or not, taxes are due today. And anyone who's waiting to file last minute, you still have a few hours left to file. Hopefully you finish yours. Yeah, I have not. But if you do <laughs> find yourself needing extra time, like I do, Alexis Christophorus explains what you need to do. It's tax day. If you can't file by midnight, don't freak out. It's okay. You're going to want to file an extension. You can file an extension on irs.gov via the free file software. You don't need to provide a reason why. This will give you until October 16th to file your tax return. An extension gives you more time to file your returns, but it doesn't give you more time to pay the government if you owe money. So if you owe, you owe tonight at midnight. And the question is, well, I didn't do my taxes, so I don't know if I owe or not. Uh, but for most people, their tax situation is more or less the same than it was in the previous year. So you want to put in whatever you paid us last year, plus maybe a little bit more to pad it. You'll get that back as a refund once we process your tax return. If you're getting a refund, you should see your money in 21 days or less, even sooner if it's direct deposit. We've been hearing that the IRS is largely sticking to that timetable this year. So that's an improvement over last year. You can track your refund with the IRS website's Where's My Refund tool. One little tip here, just check it once a day because it only updates once a day, usually at like 3 o'clock in the mornings. And if you're not sure what to do with your refund check, consider paying off high interest debt or boosting your savings. For many people, you may want to do some of both. You pay off some of this high interest debt and you set money aside for that proverbial rainy day. Alexis Christophorus, ABC News, New York. Next on Denver 7 News at 8, we're getting an answer from the city of Denver after complaints to contact Denver 7. The response after exposing predatory practices at private parking lots.
Tonight, we're following up on complaints set, sent to contact Denver 7. Now, you may remember our story on those predatory parking tickets at private parking lots in downtown Denver. Our consumer investigator, Jacqueline Allen, has been exposing this issue for the last year. Now, the city of Denver is taking action. Parking in downtown Denver. It's horrible. Requires reading the fine print. So this is the lot where you parked? Yeah, uh, back in February. Jennifer Flood found that out the hard way after her IRS appointment went long. And I was fully prepared to pay, you know, an overage fee, anticipating maybe $10, $20. Instead, about a week later, I received a bill in the mail uh, for $87 for running 30 minutes over. What she and so many others don't realize is many of these private lots are now monitored by the minute. Denver 7 has learned with more cameras comes more tickets and more complaints. Have you seen a big increase in complaints? We have seen an increase in complaints. That's getting the attention of Denver's Excise and Licenses Executive Director Molly Duplichain. What did you find? We found that the signs can be pretty confusing and that there's a lot of information on those signs. In response, Denver is announcing new signage requirements for parking lots and garages. A long list of information must be conspicuously included, from payment instructions to the penalty for parking in the lot beyond the time paid for. Parking Revenue Recovery Services, one of the largest ticket issuers downtown, says it supports any changes related to signs, as it will help reduce confusion about how to pay and reduce the number of compliance issues throughout downtown, adding they already post this information. You could get an $87 ticket on this lot. Good I did Lord. not know this. No, I did not know that. But almost everyone we talked to had no idea they only have a five minute grace period here before they could get hit with an $87 fine. We have been authorized to settle this notice. Jennifer's ticket was reduced to $67 and she paid, but wants everyone to know for her, the cost of parking downtown is too high. I think it's absolutely predatory. I think it's extortion. For Contact Denver 7, I'm Jacqueline Allen. Well, those new rules go into effect in June, or the parking operators could face fines and license suspension. The city also included a downloadable template parking lot operators can use to make so those signs more readable. Well, spring is here, and as farmers across the country work to plant their crops, some here in Colorado are taking in an innovative approach, the tech they are using in the air to reap big benefits on the ground. 